Thank you. Okay, welcome back to the last talk of the, the morning session. It's a real pleasure to have a former Georgia Tech student, now he's a highly respected professor, recently recruited by Yale. Anishit Vishnu is going to talk about entropy, capacity, and content. Thanks, Masad. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, the capacity function, which was uh, uh, which which came up very prominently in in uh, Gurwitz's work, um, and uh, you know it has connections with real stability, and it was used to prove non-trivial inequalities and also computational results um, uh, for various counting problems, including the permanent. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the problem that I'm going to be interested in, uh, the motivation for it, probably I'll skip, and then I'll talk about how we, we, we can generalize Gurwitz's notion of capacity to our setting, which we, are, which, which we are interested in, and then at the end talk about how can we compute these objects deterministically using techniques from convex optimization. So this talk will be a little bit of polynomials, a little bit of uh, convex optimization and the tying thing is entropy. So the problem uh, that I'm interested in is the following. So you're given a polynomial, which is, let's say, for the sake of this talk, a multilinear polynomial. And you can express it in this manner. So p sub alpha are the coefficients corresponding to the monomial uh, alpha. And you're also given some subset or family of monomials B. We'll talk a bit more about how these are specified. Uh, but as of now, just think about these given to you mathematically. And the computational problem that we're interested in is to find the sum of the coefficients of the polynomial corresponding to the monomials present in this specified family. So I'm not interested in all the monomials of the polynomial, but some subset of it, which is somehow described to me uh, succinctly. <clears throat> so I guess the, 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 the perhaps the most uh, uh, basic case of this problem is the permanent, which is um, a polynomial um, uh, which has a, you know which can be described in this following setting. So so here is a polynomial, which is uh, so if you're given a positive matrix A, n cross n matrix A, what you can do is take each of its row, multiply it with a vector of variables x1 to xn, and that gives you a linear form. And then you can take the product of these linear forms for all the rows, and that gives you a polynomial. It's easy to see that you can evaluate this polynomial at any given point. Um, you know, this has a very small circuit or algorithm to do this. But this is not really the permanent. What is the permanent is the coefficient of the monomial x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, which in our, in our language corresponds to recovering uh, the coefficient corresponding to the monomial 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. OK, so just a single monomial in an easily computable polynomial can encode a pretty interesting and hard object, which is the permanent. More uh, uh, sophisticated examples of this are mixed discriminant. Where, uh, which is kind of the known uh, uh, diagonal case of the permanent, where now you're given a bunch of positive definite matrices, A1 to AN, each N cross N, and you can look at this polynomial, which is the determinant now, instead of the product, of the sum of these matrices AJs when multiplied with the Jth variable. And now again, if in this polynomial I recover the coefficient corresponding to the monomial 1, 1, 1, I get what is called the mixed discriminant. This can be also used as a definition of mixed discriminant. However, my interest in this problem arose uh, by this other agenda, my research agenda, which is trying to control bias in machine learning. And I can talk offline about it. I don't want to say too much about it. But here the problem is the following. That you're given a bunch of vectors, let's say v1 to vm. Each of them sit in d dimensions. And this is the matrix corresponding to it, v. And so in particular, there is a probability distribution over these vectors, which is induced by uh, what is called the determinantal point process uh, on subsets of these vectors. And the goal is to be able to uh, count or sample from subsets of these vectors where there may be some additional constraints 
on the uh, determinantal point process. For example, the set of vectors could correspond to images of men and uh, you know male and female images, and you may be interested in sampling a subset which has a certain intersection condition with males and certain intersection condition with females. Okay, so this problem encodes and very nicely various mathematical and machine learning uh, settings, and that's what we would be interested in. So if you did not understand this motivation, uh, I can talk offline. This is not a talk in machine learning, so uh, I skip that. Um, let's talk a little bit about how this problem could be specified. So we already mentioned that the polynomial P, we should be able to evaluate at any given point. So you give me a value x1 to xn for x1 to xn, and I should be able to tell you the value. And this, in some sense, corresponds to the fact that the polynomial has a small circuit which you can use to compute it. What about the family B? So in this case, you can see that the family B can be specified explicitly as a list of monomials. However, in more interesting cases, uh, when the, the family B itself is an exponential-sized object, we can't really expect to give you the entire list of monomials. And so then we do something more interesting, which is to look at the convex hull of all the vectors in B and give you, in some sense, the least possible information about this object, which is the ability to separate over this. So what does that mean? That if I give you a point, either you should say that the point is in the polytope, and your answer should be accompanied by a mathematical proof, or if it's not, then you should give me a hyperplane such that the point is on one side of the hyperplane, and the, the convex hull of all these points is on the other side of the polytope. And this should be doable in a polynomial time with respect to the, the, the dimension of, in which these objects sit. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a new notion for, I mean, for, for the mathematicians here. I mean, this is what uh, in uh, combinatorial optimization is one very generic way to work with combinatorial polytopes. So this is the setting that we would be interested in. And the question is how well we can uh, compute this. Now, clearly, when there are such hard special cases of this, we can't really expect to do this exactly. Uh, the problem is uh, sharply hard, and in fact, likely to be even hard to approximate. And so what we will do is develop approximation algorithms for uh, computing this. The approximation ratio will come from real stability, and the computability will come from writing down relaxations for this, which use convex optimization. Um, okay, let's get back to uh, perfect matchings in bipartite graph and permanent because this is going to be really the starting point uh, for our discussion on how we can even think of writing a convex programming relaxation for this polynomial problem that we described. So we go back to what Gurwitz did, and I'm going to present you a reinterpretation of his result, which will allow me to generalize and write down a relaxation in the setting that I'm interested in. So that's, the, that's what we're going to do for the next 10, 15 minutes. So let's just recall the problem uh, uh, also of the permanent, also combinatorially. You think of you're given a, a bipartite graph with n vertices on the left and n vertices on the right. And uh, maybe there are weights associated to these edges, which we call by AIJ. And the weight of a perfect matching is just a product of the weights in each is of each of the edges present in that perfect matching. And the permanent is just a partition function corresponding to this, this object, which also, if you plug in AIJ is equal to 1, will also count the number of perfect matchings in this bipartite graph, something that has come up a few times already. So this problem is one of the central problems in theoretical computer science. Uh, some very historic uh, results. Uh, so Valiant was the uh, first to observe that this problem is sharp P hard, which means that it's unlikely that there will be a polynomial time algorithm to compute this object. And uh, uh, building up on a long line of work, Jerome Sinclair and Brigoda used techniques on Markov chains to give uh, an algorithm, which will a randomized algorithm, which would approximate the value of the permanent within a multiplicative factor of 1 plus epsilon for any specified value of epsilon. Um, <clears throat> and the running time is polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Uh, and even before this, there was a work 
uh, by Lineal, Samronitsky, and Vigderson, uh, which use uh, very old ideas from dynamical systems and particular scaling to give an e to the n approximation to compute this object permanent of a non-negative matrix. The interesting thing to note is that their algorithm was also deterministic. So given the title of this workshop is about deterministic counting, so this is, this, is, uh, this is still close to the best deterministic algorithm that we know how to compute the permanent, whereas this one is a randomized algorithm. <clears throat> so let me now mention the result that I was talking about of Gurwitz. So Gurwitz, um, you know, studied this object, which is a bit strange if you have never seen this before, but I guess here many people have seen this before. Um, it's still, you know, always when I look at it for the first time, it looks surprising. So he considered this polynomial P sub A for a matrix A, which is the product of the linear forms corresponding to rows, and divided this polynomial by a product of xi's, and let's say, let's see what happens when we minimize this polynomial divided by product of xi's uh, over the positive orthant. Okay, so it looks at the infimum over x positive. So this notation means that each coordinate of x is positive. And this is what is called the capacity of the polynomial. And using uh, the, the theory of uh, you know, hyperbolic or real stable polynomials, uh, Gurwitz proved that this quantity here is a pretty good approximation to the permanent of this matrix, kind of close to what uh, Lineal, Samronitsky, and Vigderson proved. The question, of course, is can we compute this object? Right? So they, they, they also had an algorithm which could do that. The question is, can, 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 can we compute this? And this question is addressed in Gurwitz's work as well. So there is an algorithm which you can use to compute this capacity. <clears throat> so I guess if I want to generalize this notion of capacity to the problem that I talked about, given that you can view uh, the permanent as computing a certain coefficient of this polynomial which, which fits in the previous setting, I need to answer a bunch of questions. So one is how, you know, how can I think about this relaxation in a, in a more interesting manner which will allow me to generalize. Um, and once I have this, how can I guarantee an approximation and then finally talk about the computability. So it turns out that the uh, so the conceptually hardest part is to think about this. Once we have this, this is rather easily follows from Gurwitz's work. And the computability part is uh, quite non-trivial, and I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, in, the, in the most general setting. In Gurwitz's setting, it's, 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 it's fine, but once we generalize it to arbitrary polytopes and general polynomials, the computability becomes a real issue. <clears throat> Any questions so far? And okay. The deterministic versus randomization in say this maybe estimation or computation of capacity. Sorry? In computing capacity will we'll talk deterministic. About. Yeah. So these these will be uh, you know algorithms which are uh, yeah, I mean which which are in the realm of convex optimization <laughs> and so things like ellipsoid method or interior point method. Yeah. But in practice, actually, if you want to make it faster, it's completely fine to do some acute uh, randomized algorithm, but potentially. For machine learning. Oh, I was looking for you. You are sitting right here. <laughs> okay. No, I was trying to find you in the room. You are sitting right here. <laughs> okay, great. So, let's, uh, so th this is our goal, to generalize this theory to the setting of polynomials and polytopes. So, Let's, let's, let's see what the connection first is between counting and entropy. This is a connection that goes back to Boltzmann. In fact, it's Boltzmann's famous equation, which is even on his grave, uh, which I guess many people here have seen. If not, I highly recommend. Uh, 
<laughs> so, so Boltzmann was thinking about the second law of thermodynamics, and essentially these ideas can lead us via some slightly more sophisticated convex duality to the following very simple uh, uh, convex optimization characterization of the permanent. So now let's look at the, uh, the object, which I call P sub PM, where M is a set of all perfect matchings in, the, in, in this bipartite graph and PFM is just the convex hull. So this is just nothing but the bipartite matching polytope or the, or as we know, it's the Birkhoff von Neumann polytope. Okay, so this is an object that many people here know. And so you're given some weight uh, to each vertex. And let's ask ourselves the following question. Is there, so suppose I give you a point theta, which is inside the polytope, okay? Well, a point inside a convex polytope can be written as a convex combination of its vertices, potentially in many, many different ways. One particularly nice way to write it as a convex combination is to take the one which maximizes the entropy of the distribution induced by the convex hull. So if, so if I write this as half times this and half times this, then the entropy is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, well, I can't write it as half times this and half times this because this is, this is outside, but you can imagine that if I write it as a convex hull of its vertices, the, the, there is a particular distribution that arises and you can look at the entropy of that. And that's exactly uh, this quantity here, which I call primal of theta. So primal um, essentially hints to the fact that there is a dual that is coming of this object. And this is, if I fix AM, this is a concave function. Entropy is a con I mean, this is negative entropy, actually. So, uh, uh, so this, is a, this is a concave function. And we are maximizing a concave function. So this is a convex, function, a convex optimization. And you can prove uh, that if the point theta is in the interior of this polytope, then a certain duality holds. And uh, well, OK, maybe I skipped this fact. Uh, you may ask first that what is the point theta which maximizes the entropies. Uh, so if I look at this value and I change theta throughout the polytope, which point maximizes the entropy? Any ideas which point maximizes the entropy? The image of the moment map. The, the image of the moment map. No, polynomial which corresponds to scaled the matrix. Marginal probabilities of the random perfect matching. Right. So it's the, it's, it's the following. Ah, this is so this, is, this goes back to Shannon, right? That the entropy maximizing distribution is the uniform distribution. What's the support of this distribution? The support of this distribution is all perfect matchings. So if you pick the point which corresponds to the, the average of all the vertices, OK? So take, take, take the same weight on all the vertices and look at the, you know, look at the point that you get, that is the point that will maximize this, this uh, objective function. And, and you can prove that the value is exactly equal to log of the permanent. What's the problem with this? Why, why is this not an, give you an algorithm? I mean, after all, there are rumors that convex optimization is in polynomial time, right? Yeah, so this is a, a convex program where the number of variables is exponential. The number of perfect matchings can be exponential. So we don't know how to do this. Well, but there are, if you are smart enough and you know more, you can say, let's take the dual. And you can take the dual uh, of this program. And this is what it turns out to be. <coughs> um, what are potential issues to optimize this for any theta? Now here, the number of variables, uh, so lambda is a vector, which is, or a matrix, however you want to think of it. So the number of variables is n squared at most here. The issue here is in computing or evaluating this object. And because it essentially is kind of a cyclic thing. To evaluate this object or its gradient, uh, you need to evaluate this quantity here, which is the same as some kind of a permanent. So you're not really getting around this problem. Um, but yeah, you can you can prove uh, 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 you, you know so so the, this duality 
uh, implies that if I look at the, the supremum or all points inside the polytope of this object, it is exactly equal to the permanent. So how do I get from here to here? I actually made a transformation that zij is e to the lambda ij, a hyperbolic transformation uh, to come down to this problem. This is not a convex optimization problem. This is what is called geodesically convex optimization problem, where if, if you define the right metric, then uh, you get this. Um, so this starts looking more and more like what Gurwitz is doing, but still it seems not exactly the same thing. And in particular, uh, we neither know how to evaluate this polynomial, um, uh, nor do we know anything about the optimization aspect of it. So, so we will try to simplify this and arrive at. Uh, but the nice thing about this interpretation is that this has nothing to do with matchings. You can do this over any set of objects, uh, any set of combinatorial objects. <clears throat> so let's look at this, uh, this thing that we just derived. Um, the problem with this is that you know, the polynomial in the, in the numerator is hard to evaluate. Uh, and one observation about the, uh, the polytope of bipartite perfect matchings is that it's an, in so bipartite perfect matching is an intersection of two matroids, for those of who you know what it means. And in particular, that also implies that you can write down this polytope as the intersection of two polytopes, which are the following. So, so on the left-hand side, you have this polytope, which corresponds to, um, column stochastic matrices. So for every column, the sum of all the entries is equal to one. And the right hand side corresponds to row stochastic matrices, which, and so if you look at the intersection of these two objects, then you can recover back this polytope. It has some structure, which is kind of interesting. So one thing we can do is to, to make this polynomial a little bit uh, more tractable is to just restrict this or just relax this to be uh, only on one of, one of these polytopes. So for example, what I do here is starting from this polytope here, I consider this P tilde of Z, which is just a Newton polytope with the appropriate weights of, uh, of this polytope corresponding to M2. Uh, this now becomes easy to evaluate, and this is uh, this is also what I mean, you know, in some sense, what Guritz was yeah. doing. And so basically, I had these two things here. Uh, so theta belonging to PM. PM is an intersection of two objects. What I did was I moved one object here and one object there. So the moment I realize I have an intersection of two different combinatorial objects. I, I consider this kind of a relaxation where I now optimize theta over the first polytope and evaluate the polynomial only at the second polytope. So technically this is not a relaxation because I really can't prove that this quantity is related at all to this. But this is a heuristic way to make your polynomial optimization problem at least now not suffer the the consequences of that I can't even evaluate the polynomial or I can't, I can't optimize over the polytope. Okay, so this, uh, there's nothing really stopping us from going ahead and looking at what happens uh, uh, with, this, with this. So one thing we can do is, in this object, we can replace zij's with xi for all j's. And the reason is, that when we're optimizing over theta, which belongs to this set of column stochastic matrices, it doesn't really, you can pick different z's, but you don't have to. Because theta ij sum up to one uh, for every column, uh, making this replacement doesn't change the optimization problem at all. And what you recover is exactly Gurwitz's relaxation. So we made 
a conceptual jump from hair to hair, we observed that the optimization problem and the polynomial are entangled. We kind of separated them out into two different things, uh, moved one part of the complexity here and the second part of the complexity here, and now both objects become tractable. And now we just do some very simple substitution and arrive at this quantity. I don't know if this is how you thought of it, but uh, perhaps not. No. But historically, again, yeah. a little okay. This, uh, this relax that for for the permanent, this relaxation is a long story. <coughs> this formula, actually, this was the way to prove existence of synchro scaling due to David London from uh, yeah. Haifa University. Okay, so the the the, the the main kind of trust of what I did was that you can use the thing for general polynomial, okay? Lo forget yeah. about metric structure, forget about matroids, use for general polynomials, and magically it gives you ability to prove lower bounds. So this was how, histor how it historically happened. Yeah. And now we will see that this, this way of looking at it very easily allows us to generalize uh, or come up with a notion of capacity for the problem that I showed you in the first slide. Okay? So, sorry, go yeah. So, a priori you said it's not clear how this new relaxation is related to... It's not uh, clear, yeah, at all. Result, it, it shows that it is related, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it uses the fact that uh, this is, I mean, okay, this polynomial has additional special properties, for instance, it's real stable. So, but what is the main kind of uh, essence of your that of uh, that intersection of two yeah. things. Two yeah. Simple yeah, things. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you remember, let's go back to the problem in the, in the beginning, right? That we had a polynomial and we had a polytope, right? And these two objects, we, we wanted to intersect by computing the sum of the coefficients of the polynomial restricted to this polytope. This is what we wanted to do. So there was always an intersection hidden somewhere. And if these two quantities were a priori not tractable, then this problem anyway doesn't make sense. So we are assuming that the evaluation of this polynomial is easy, as well as separation over this polytope is easy. So there is already some kind of easiness to both these objects. And yeah, so we do exactly what I, at a high level, suggested. We, we look at the supremum over the polytope and uh, of this quantity. And that's our generalization of the capacity. It looks simple, but it took us a long time to arrive at that. This, what is the right notion of capacity, which even makes sense? I think Nima here will talk about a different way uh, to arrive at something similar. So, so one second. Capacity, the way, the way you wrote is uh, like depending on those Newton polytopes. So capacity in general as a function of that uh, of those exponent is log concave. Okay, so maximizing the point. So this is not convex optimization anymore. No, no, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just trying okay. Yeah. So I have what I've done is added a supremum term here, which in some sense uh, was missing from Gurwitz's thing because it got absorbed by this additional structure that matching had. So if I go back to this, so what I try to, 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 to tell you or to understand, so it's supposed to be realized on the on the extreme points of the polytope. Um. Because I know that capacity is log concave. But this is not the usual notion of capacity. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so know, just I wanted to show you this again, that yeah. we had a problem in which there was something outside of this infimum. It disappeared here in this formula, right? And I think that's an important thing to note. So what we did was we basically recovered what, was, what should have been here, which allows us to then generalize it to the setting. If you just write it like this, it's not clear. But here you are using the fact that this has this property that the columns sum up to one. So you can remove that optimization. 
but in general you can't. So this is our relaxation. This, uh, this is joint work uh, with, with Damien Strashak from a couple of years ago. And we also proved a theorem, uh, which is uh, that this quantity is some kind of a relaxation to the quantity that we would like. Um, in particular, it's finite, finite, uh, uh, you know, whenever, should we be here? Uh, B supports a real stable polynomial and it depends only on B. Okay, so this should be B here, sorry. Um, however, there, I mean, so, so yeah, this, this, as I said, that this is, once we arrive here, this is, uh, this is, a couple of pages and follows, uh, you know, essentially from past work on which is which was a lot. I mean, you know, real stable polynomials. The question that was not at all clear was how do you compute this object? And that's what I think I'm going to spend a little bit of time on in in the remaining of my talk. And if somebody is really interested in seeing the proof of this, I can just uh, go during the question questions time that I have. Yeah, so what is, the, what is the question? What's the issue here? Well, uh, this is an optimization problem over a polytope, where theta could be any point inside this polytope. And this is really what the dual looks like. As I said, that this is not a convex, uh, this is not a convex optimization problem. Uh, it is convex after the hyperbolic substitution. <coughs> But we would really like to have an algorithm which is able to compute this object or the value or a point for any point inside. This point could also be on the boundary. Yes? Do you really need the reusability in that box? Oh, in this? No, yeah. it's fine. No, no, it's, I just simplified the theorem. Yeah, yeah, there's a more complicated theorem. You have seen the paper, so you know that. Yeah. <laughs> So this is just, yeah, it's, it's not real stability. It's something weaker than that. Uh, the m is e to the n for the... Yeah, m is basically e to the n, e to the m, e to the m, m. yeah. But you need some, probably some kind of strong lock and kill, strong lock and cavity. Is this all your problem? Yeah, but yeah. If, you, if you only care about n being finite, yes. you don't need anything, any, any arbitrary... True, example. but yes. if you need this, uh, yeah, this is like, okay. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not going to focus so much on this. Uh, I presume uh, Nima will talk or you know talk more about uh, this. So let me focus on the computability, which I think is uh, is important, and it gives it. I mean, that's what makes these these results useful in some sense. Besides inequalities. Uh, uh, maybe. I'm going to skip these proofs. As you see, it's not so much. Uh, I mean, the entropy interpretation gives you one inequality, and Gurwitz's result gives you the other inequality. Okay. Um, let's get to computability of these. So our goal in the next 10 minutes is to solve this optimization problem, which is parameterized by theta. So theta is a parameter. And the optimization problem involves this. And we are given an oracle to evaluate p at any given point. And we are also given, a, let's say, we, we will have to use some properties about this, where the point lies. You know, so, so what is a polytope? What's the structure of the polytope? And there's a very generic method to solve convex optimization problems, um, which is called the ellipsoid method. <clears throat> so let me just quickly review that for the mathematicians in the audience. So the optimization problem essentially is first reduced to just a search problem where you're given some number A, and either you tell me that the, op the optimum value is at most A plus epsilon or bigger than A for some given epsilon, and we would like the running time of this algorithm to depend logarithmically on 1 over epsilon. And the general idea is the following. So first we assume that the optimal solution 
lies in some very large ball or, or some ball which is bounded by some radius r and the value of the function is also bounded in some, in some interval. We need these assumptions and we also need to know what the value of r and f are for this algorithm to make sense. So the algorithm, what it does is it's, it, okay. it starts, there's a picture here, I don't know why it's not showing up. There's a picture here which I wanted you to see that you start off with some kind of a, a ellipsoid or a ball which is guaranteed to contain the optimal point. This guarantee is kind of, I mean, you're, you're searching for this optimal point. You need to know that you have at least have some idea where, where it lies. And then what the algorithm does is it, it returns the center of this ellipsoid and checks whether the value of the function that you have is at most what you're looking for. If so, you stop. If not, you use this evaluation oracle for this polynomial to get the gradient of this function. <coughs> and then construct a new ellipsoid, which is obtained by cutting the old ellipsoid by a hyperplane, and then looking at the minimum volume ellipsoid that encloses this new object. And then you stop when the radius of the ellipsoid becomes really small. Because then you know, well, you have to prove, but then that's, you know, you have to stop at some point. You cannot keep doing this forever. So to bound the number of iterations of this algorithm, we, we will have to give bounds on this parameter r, f, and, and uh, more generally how the ellipsoid method depends on r, f, and epsilon. <coughs> So uh, this is a theorem. I mean, the proof of this appears, uh, for instance, in the book by Grotschel, Lowash, and Schreiber, that the running time of this method, by running time, I mean the, num the total time it takes for this algorithm to solve this problem, that either the optimum is at most a plus epsilon or bigger than a, is bounded by some polynomial in m, which is the number of uh, which is the dimension of the object, t sub f, which is the time to evaluate the function f, which in our case is, since the polynomial is you know, simple to evaluate, we can evaluate it. t sub gradient of f, this is the time to evaluate the gradient of f. And more importantly, and this is what we're going to focus on, is the log of r, which is the radius, in which of, you know, or the, or, are bound on the optimal point, f, which is a bound on the value of the function, and epsilon, which is the accuracy. <coughs> okay. So for this to be a polynomial time algorithm, we need to provide at most an exponential bound on r, f, or epsilon. Well, r and f. Okay, epsilon is fine. So, so here is the, you know, here is a problem uh, with this. Oh, okay, let, let's first do the simple part. So, this entropy interpretation actually tells us that the value of the function, which is which is the bound on f, can't be much more. So that's bounded by m, and that's that follows from the following. So this is the function that we wanted to optimize. And we also know through duality that it has, you know, it has, it has a certain form. It's an entropy of something. And at least in the case where the p's are all one, let's say, we can bound the entropy of a distribution on at least, let's say, on at most two to the m vertices by the log of that, which is m. So this is not quite correct, but this is morally correct because if I look at, go back to the multilinear setting where we just have, you know, zero, one points, then the number of such points cannot be more than two to the m because we are in m dimensions. And an entropy 
maximizing distribution on that is at most m. So because of duality, we can get this bound, that the f is not too large. So this is the easy part. But it does use this duality. The issue becomes bounding r. And one of the things that you can already notice is that as this point starts to go closer and closer to the boundary, what starts to happen is that the optimal solution necessarily has to go to infinity. And the reason is that if this point was actually on this boundary, then none of these vertices should have any probability mass on them. right? And because the probability mass is controlled by an exponential, the exponential can never be uh, zero unless the point is at infinity. So it is necessarily true that this point y star must be at infinity as you're approaching close to the boundary. So now if you were to run this algorithm for some value of theta, which is really, really close to the boundary, you expect this r to become larger and larger. So you cannot really expect this to be a polynomial time algorithm. OK? So this was handled. In fact, it's, it's, I think it's a more non-trivial part of this paper by Gurbitz and Sam Ronitsky. Uh, that I, I don't know if I got the date right, but this is where they give an algorithm for mixed discriminant. Uh, that a bulk of the paper is in some sense essentially trying to uh, prove something like this implicitly or even explicitly, right? Yeah. And it was also used in uh, results of Jeff Kahn and Kale, a bunch of them, uh, where they tried to understand um, uh, hardcore distributions on matchings in graphs. And it turns out um, that there is this decay of correlation between the edges, they pick uh, uh, random matching according to the hardcore distribution. The correlation between these edges decays with respect to the with respect to the distance between these edges, if the hardcore distribution has some nice properties. So it's not true for any. Uh, for any. So these these things were used, and I guess in the TCS community, um, uh, they were used or discovered in the context of spanning tree polytope uh, in approaches to things like TSP and ATSP by Cheyenne and uh, others. Um, so we, uh, with, with Mohit Singh, we, in 2014, we actually were not looking at this capacity problem, but we were interested in the max entropy problem. And what we proved was that something very nice happens, that if the point theta is in the interior of the polytope, where uh, what it means is that you can put a ball of radius eta around this point, and this ball is entirely contained inside the polytope, then r can be bounded by some polynomial in 1 over eta. So while this is a nice result, it still doesn't help us solve this problem, because here we cannot really guarantee that the point theta will always be eta away from the boundary. Um, and actually, there's a bigger problem. That when, when I'm saying that this optimal solution does lie at infinity, so we really cannot compute the optimal solution. But what we can do is compute something which is an approximate solution. So it's enough to find a y so that this function here, h theta y, which is this thing inside the infimum, is no more than the optimal value plus some epsilon. And there is no reason for such a y to be at infinity. Such a y could be potentially much closer in a smaller ball. And that's what we, that's what we prove in a, in, a, uh, in a recent result, that under some very generic uh, general assumptions on the polytope, we can prove that there is always an epsilon approximating point, which lies in a ball of radius m um, times something like polylog 1 over epsilon. And this allows us to at least bypass this issue of uh, the bounding box, which ellipsoid method requires. A 
Okay, a couple of more minutes. So I'll maybe just tell you, uh, I'll show you this proof. It's much simpler. This proof is more complicated and has lot of, lots of details. So let me in the next couple of minutes give you some idea as to what is the interesting aspect of proving such a theorem. So what I'm going to show you is this old result with Mohit, uh, which, which tells us uh, that if the point is sufficiently in the interior of the polytope, you can recover a bound on the optimal solution of the dual, which is bounded by m over eta. And you can see how general this result is. So we will use this fact that entropy over a discrete set of size at most 2 to the m is at most m. This is something we have used. And, uh, <clears throat> and this in particular implies that the dual uh, at the optimal point lambda star is bounded by m and if I if from this I I can easily deduce that for each each matching or in this case each set s each vertex of the polytope it <laughs> satisfies this inequality that the inner product of the optimal dual point with this given point theta minus the inner product of the optimal dual point with respect to the indicator vector of a particular vertex is at most m. And this starts feeling like some kind of polarity is going on, and that's indeed what is the case. You can just uh, rewrite this equation and argue that the inner product of the vector minus lambda star by m with v minus theta, where v is any point inside the polytope, is bounded by 1. Okay. So if for a moment you assume that theta is uh, theta is zero, or theta is the origin, then this immediately implies that the point minus lambda star by m is in the polar of the convex hull. So very elementary convex geometry. And I claim this is enough for us to establish some bound. The fact that the optimal point lies in the polar of the polytope, roughly, and the fact that there is a small ball that is contained, contained inside the polytope immediately imply a bound. The reason is that if you have a polytope in which some ball lies inside, then the polar of this polytope <coughs> is contained in the polar of the ball. Okay? And we know what the polar of the ball looks like. We know that if, since this ball has radius at least eta, we know that the polar of the ball has radius at most mo, uh, 1 over eta. Okay. So we knew that minus lambda star by m lies somewhere here, and this object lies here, and I know what the bound of, uh, you know, the, this is of radius at most 1 by eta, so we get that the, the L2 norm of lambda star is at most m by eta. So at least you have some bound. And so all the previous arguments that I mentioned, including Gurwitz's result or, or uh, uh, Kahn, Jeff Kahn's result, they heavily use the structure of the polytope. They also get slightly better bounds. Uh, but it's not clear all that structure is really necessary. And that's what our next result shows, which, uh, which I'm going to have to skip. Well, very simple geometry. OK, so let's, uh, let's just, uh, yeah, I, I'll just skip through this and happy to answer questions in the, let me just conclude. Uh, um, in this talk, we, we, we looked at a problem of, uh, you know, accounting problem, which whose motivation, at least for me, came from machine learning. And what we did was we looked at Gurwitz's capacity, generalized it to this setting. Um, and I guess in this, entropy was a crucial ingredient. Understanding Gurwitz's result from entropy point of view was really useful. And the end result was a deterministic approximate counting algorithm for a wide variety of uh, problems. And interestingly, also includes this object called the Brasskamp leap constant uh, for the rank one case, where you know, Raphael is the expert here on that, um, which um, which is a very interesting constant, uh, and its computability is known only
for this rank one case, and essentially through, through these methods. There is no other way to compute this constants arising in this inequality other than uh, coming up with algorithms like the one I showed you, at least so far. So I guess uh, a couple of uh, questions that arise. Given that these algorithms are actually useful for machine learning, it's actually useful to have faster algorithms compared to ellipsoid method. And so one direction could be to come up with, uh, um, you know, are there versions of scaling type algorithms uh, for this general setting? And finally, uh, as I mentioned, and this comment is a bit mysterious, but it does relate to this brass Campley problem, is that, I mean, capacity uh, is really not a convex optimization problem. It is, in a very elementary form, form a geodesically convex optimization problem. <clears throat> and this, is, this holds more generally. And so if you want to make progress in estimating a brass camp leap constant for higher rank case, which is useful in various theoretical computer science and mathematical settings, uh, we would be we would need to generalize much of what I talked on this on these slides to the setting of Riemannian manifolds. And I can talk about it offline. And with this I'll thank you for your attention and take any questions that you have. So the, from the practical point of view, for which, so you need to compute those probabilities on certain supports. For which supports you can do, what kind of restriction on the support? You no restriction, no, pretty no, much. Get, yeah. So what you need from the support, you oh, need some so, kind of board. So this is the precise statement that the, the support is described by some polytope. I don't need to know the inequalities of the polytope, all I need to know is that the coefficients in the inequalities of this polytope are bounded. So one second, support, you mean like support is described by extreme points of the polytope? Yes. Well, the faces. These are the, these are the inequalities that describe the faces. The supporting inequalities. So what I want is the following, once again, that if this polytope is described by a bunch of inequalities, as long as there is some way to describe this polytope in a manner so that each supporting hyperplane the numbers that appear in that are bounded. So let's assume everything is an integer to put some kind of a scale to it. If all these numbers are bounded by some number m, then the bound depends polynomially on it. And in all combinatorial polytopes that you can imagine, this is true. You'll have to be really creative to come up with polytopes where the hyperplane inequalities require exponentially sized numbers in the dimension. So this is the only condition that we need, actually, to establish uh, epsilon approximate solutions. So, so, so really, OK, so really, let me rephrase it. So the other way to compute this probability would be like this. I associate a polynomial, which is, uh, let's say, a multilinear case, which is 1 at those monomials at coefficient at 0, and take kind of that product of the thing, OK? So, uh, and if that polynomial happened to be, let's say, stable or the log concave, then you can apply the, you can apply the, the same in Yeah, yeah. You, okay. okay, so which yeah. responds roughly to the case when support is a matroid. So yes, that's right. And you will get better, so will you get in this strategy, will you get better ones? No, I don't think so. So I mean, computationally kind of the same stuff? Pretty much, yeah. So for matroids, so well, for real stable polynomials, you get something more general called jump systems, I guess. And, and, and it is true, and I think it follows from some uh, works, uh, which were uh, you know, previous works, that real st the, the Newton polytopes of real stable polynomials have this property that their defining inequalities have coefficients which are 0, 1, or minus 1. Right? This is something you knew before. Yeah, so, so, that, so, so all those polytopes are also included in this. But this is much beyond the matroid structure, so, yeah. Any other questions? So one thing that wasn't completely clear to me, so you had the bounds uh, with this, say, uh, different version of capacity with that thing, <coughs> and then uh, m, that was shown to be finite, and maybe e to mm -hmm. the m. And yeah, e to the m, so yeah. For a different problem, 
No. That fits in this framework. Besides computing the main quantity, one also needs an estimate on this capital right. M. Yes. So how, what about that? That's that always manageable? Well, it is manageable in the settings that uh, we <coughs> cared about, which is, uh, you know, DPPs are real stable. So determinantal point processes are real stable because they arise through some kind of a determinant. So uh, going back to the machine learning applications, you know, where if you remember in the first slide, I mentioned the determinantal formula. Right. So that is, yeah, so for that, those applications, it's manageable. Oh, there is a there is a real demo for somebody who wants to see all this, which is available from my website. So we actually developed algorithms and used them. So. Any other questions? So if not, we have okay, a thank break you. And we